Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and this morning I got a chance to have an interview with Kimberly from the Rose Geek YouTube channel and it was a great conversation. I got some good recommendations on some roses, David Austin roses in particular, which is not something I've had a lot of in my collection up to this point, so I got some recommendations for you there. We also talked a lot about the kinds of things we'll be doing in our respective gardens. Hers is an East Coast garden out in Maryland and mine is a West Coast garden here uh, just east of Vancouver in British Columbia. Columbia. And so we got to contrast some of those things and talk about the projects that we're taking on both for our YouTube channels and for our gardens themselves. So I hope you'll stick around for that conversation. Side note, there is a second portion of this conversation that we reconvened later and we talked about propagating roses. And uh, it's, a, it's a full rose Q&A for propagation that she'll have hosted on her channel. I will be linking that video down below uh, simultaneously with the release of this one. So if you want to go to the propagation Q&A, that's where you'll find it. Hi Kimberly, it's so good to meet you. It's uh, I know we've been back and forth a little bit by email talking about how we're going to do this uh, this video call, uh, but uh, finally, good to finally meet you in in person, so to speak. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Right on. Well, you know, I think this could be a, a big advantage for our viewers, uh, given that we're going to chat about some of the upcoming projects in our respective gardens and here on the farm. And, uh, and so that's where I wanted to start the conversation here is because I've, this is the time of year where I really spend a lot of time thinking about what's next season going to look like. I, I'm just fresh off the heels of my last selling season or having visitors on the farm who've told me nice things or not so nice things about being here. Uh, and so I start thinking, well, what do I, uh, what do I want to do next on the farm? So I've got lots of projects. How do you, how do you view this time of year? Is this a, a recap time for you as well? So, you know, coming to the end of the season, it's always with mixed emotions because I'm going to miss all of these beautiful blooms that I've had all season, but honestly, I really need a break. And I'm not sure if you feel the same, but I am looking forward to the next month or two as things are slowing down. And so I just have some general ideas that I've been able to put in place now for next season. But I think as you know, I'm really looking for things to do, maybe December-ish, I can really put some thought into the projects for next year. So what we can expect is I love the unboxings and I'm still going to be sharing new vendors with everybody so that they know that they have a lot of options for who to buy from. Um, I'm gonna be showing how those roses are maturing through the year in my garden in case there's something that people have thought about adding. Um, and they'll be able to see what it looks like and decide if it would work in their garden. But when I think about big projects that are new, I'm new to climbers. And so I've been thinking a lot about where I can add climbers. And I think I've got orders in now for maybe 10 or 15 climbers. And it's kind of intimidating. And I haven't wanted to put a whole lot of thought into it because I think when we think about climbers, I'm thinking, okay, well, I only have so many structures to put these up against. I can certainly climb it up against the house, but I am planning for the next season to peg most of my climbers. And hopefully that'll help somebody who maybe has more of limited space that they're trying to crunch uh, roses into. So I wanna show how to peg. And um, of course I wanna learn how to propagate and I am going to learn how to do it. If it's the last thing I do, I have failed so many times. So I'm definitely going to learn how to propagate and share my successes and failures with everybody to hopefully help them through that. And um, I would like to add roses to my pier. I have a unique environment for some people um, that it is very high winds and um, salt water. And so I want to put roses in pots um, that I can't, I honestly, for the life of me, I'm having a real block about what size and what type, and I'll be looking for recommendations there, but I wanna put them into the pier and run drip to that. And finally, I'm hoping that somebody named Jason will help us put together a video on how to compost. You mentioned in one of your previous videos that, um, that you were looking to uh, compost your rose canes, which is a brilliant idea because we all have cuttings and we should be using those things to nourish our rose gardens. But I have dug into composting and I am so intimidated. 
and I seem to get lost in greens and browns and what kind of device do I use, a tumbler or let it, you know, be a hot compost by itself. And so I'm really hoping that you will consider helping us and me, you know, through that journey and finding an economical solution for a chipper. But those are the plans that I have for my garden. How about yours? <laughs> do you think that, first of all, do you accept the challenge? Will you do a video for us? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely be back with you on that topic. I mean, I, I made a video a little while back where I showed people the ugly in my yard, and part of it is big rose clippings that are just hanging around in a pile. And oftentimes, I'll get to the end of the year, and just because the pile has grown so large, I'll burn it. Uh, but I don't I can't really let it sit around for that length of time anymore. I'm, uh, some of the changes we're making on the farm here is that we're starting to see a, a little more demand for people who want to visit the farm. Uh, who want to make their purchases in person. A lot of the time in the past, we were selling through farmer's markets and other selling events. But uh, in the past couple of years, we've had more visitors here on the farm and uh, we weren't initially as set up for that or receptive to that. Uh, and now we're becoming that way. So we're, we're going to have a lot more people on the farm. So leaving big piles of, of rose debris all over the place just is not an option for me anymore. It's, it's, not, it's not something I want to do. So the chipper. I have it in hand. Uh, I have I have a chipper here. Uh, I, I'm not going to show it to you until I've tried it. Uh, okay. Put it together. I'm going to, you know, and then start trying it. But I think the idea for me is to chip the waste and get it into small bits and use it in places in the garden. Now, here's the thing about uh, taking rose waste or rose debris that has like black spots on the stems and all of that type stuff. I get nervous, of course, about re-adding that to my roses. And I also don't want to add it uh, if it's chippings of roses with the, with the thorns on it. I certainly don't want to add it to the paths around the yard as far as wood chips that people could be walking on or, or get stabbed by. So I think I'm going to alternate those out to my perennial beds. And I think that's how I'll probably be managing it is I'll be chipping from the roses. I'll be adding to the perennials. All of the compost that comes from the perennials and the shrubs and the trees and everything else, I can use that to get it back towards the roses. So I do have a balance of, of things in the yard here, some, some beds for each, and that's probably how I'll be approaching that. So in terms of climbers, you have, I mean, now you say you're going to peg a lot of them, which is great. And I, I, I want to just chip in with, with one quick comment is that I've done climbers, some of the rigid climbers that I've grown, I've actually grown as freestanding shrub. Just, just let them go straight up. And I've seen that in gardens as well. And, you know, like pegging, you're going to, if you get that, those, those uh, especially pliable canes and you pin them down, obviously you're going to get a lot more flowers. Uh, but for something like, and I've seen two or three examples that I really liked a lot. One of them was Westerland, uh, which I saw in a local garden. I saw another one called Salita, which I think is naturally a large climber, but this thing was growing Oh, 16, 18 feet just on rigid canes and, and you know, a wow. ball of a ball of color. And uh, Rosarium Uderson as well also has big, thick, firm canes. And I think there's something to be said for some of those ones that are strong bloomers already and have that kind of rigid structure uh, that if you if you have a bit of space to apply them to and you don't mind having a large freestanding shrub, that they can be trained that way as well. But I like your idea of pegging a lot of them. Uh, one of the solutions I came here, uh, it's it's to my right here, but you aren't going to see it, is we have a, a sort of a split rail fence that I've used in a lot of shots for the videos. And uh, take the climbers there and just horizontally pin them down and train them across that fence. And having a little bit of horizontal space like that is a really nice thing. I thought I saw in one of your videos that you had a Westerland uh, that you were keeping shorter. And one of the questions that I have, especially uh, for my newbies that have smaller spaces, maybe they're trying to keep a garden within, will climbers be receptive to being packed down? So if I say, I only want that rose to be eight feet max, but if I buy something that says that it really wants to grow 12 foot, will that rose still be happy if we cut down? I don't know if it'll be happy. It, it certainly will not be obedient. Uh, it's, okay, it'll, it, it'll... It, it, it's not going to obey you. But, okay. you know, uh, the so the Westerland that you saw me keeping in a small shape, that's my propagation stock. So I have uh, the field of propagation roses and I all of those we cut from frequently. But, 
you know, the funny thing about that is that some of the climbers that are under that treatment actually perform really, really nicely with lots and lots of cutting back. That treatment seems to agree with some plants. Other ones, you'll never get them to live that way. They'll never, they'll never accept, uh, they'll, they'll just keep on throwing long canes and they'll, and they'll, they'll not bloom on them or they'll do something that you can't do. I think, I think actually one example, and you may grow this rose, I think it was on your list was uh, Cecil Brunner. Um, the sweetheart. I think, I think I have that one on order. Oh, okay. I saw it on your list, but um, I tried to maintain it a little bit smaller. Never, ever, ever worked for me. Never even bloomed for me. It resented that so badly. It said, screw you. <laughs> Pardon my <laughs> language. I'm yeah. not going, I'm not going to bloom for you because you keep on cutting me back. Right. Um, aggressively. Uh, so it just kept on sending big long canes that never resulted in anything. Uh, here I've left it alone and it seems to be uh, blooming quite a lot better. So uh, it, it, as with all of our roses, I think it's a, it's an introduction process, uh, you know, get, getting to know you, uh, you know, what you'll, how, how the rose will behave under different kinds of culture uh, and which ones do nicely pinned down and which ones are, 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 will, will handle being grown as an upright shrub and which ones, uh, will take uh, repeated pruning down and how they'll perform under those circumstances. Thoughts on one-time bloomers. Cause I, when I've looked through my spreadsheet, sometimes I buy a rose and um, I don't even really take a hard look. I just know it's beautiful and I have to have it. And as I'm going through now with my tracking spreadsheet, I'm like, oh, this is supposed to be a one-time bloomer. And I think in a larger garden where you have a lot of blooms, you can, have a few one-time bloomers um, as long as you have flushes through your other roses. And so I wanted to find out your feelings on antique roses or one-time bloomers, ramblers. Well, I think you know my feelings is that I like them. Uh, and, I, and, and that's, but I understand everybody's got a different gardening situation. And for some people it's valuable real estate and you're not going to say, you're not going to take a big one-time bloomer, give it you know, a 10 foot space in your yard, let it bloom once in the spring. And then it's just foliage for the rest of the season. That's just not going to work for that, for that, uh, for that uh, gardener. Um, if you have a large enough, uh, large enough space, I reckon, you know, I, I think you don't make it your, your backbone, but if you have one or two, if you can make a point of finding one or two that you kind of like and putting them in your garden. And I think it really has to be also driven by what you love what, what you, what, what turns you on as a gardener. Uh, I don't think you can find something, uh, you know, I'll, I'll maybe uncertain a, a photo here, but I, I posted it to Instagram earlier this year or to one of my rose groups was a uh, Robert Le Diable, which is a centifolia that just does this sprawly, wonderful habit and just covers itself with purplish modeled blooms early in the season. Uh, and it lasts for a good three weeks. Now compare that to uh, a rhododendron or a spirea or, you know, a, a hydrangea or some of the other ones that you don't necessarily get repeat blooming off of. And you would say, well, that's a wonderfully performing shrub. But the problem is that because we're comparing it to other roses, we're comparing it to Julia Child, we're comparing it to, uh, you know, these, these really strong repeat bloomers, uh, the, that changes the economics of the situation. Now you can't afford to give the space to that big guy. So uh, I understand it's not for everybody. Uh, and I just do want to distinguish here, you know, on the one hand, quickly between uh, old garden roses and repeat bloomers, because I want to say that even if you can't find, even if you can't justify in your head, I want to give space to this one-time bloomer in my yard. You could probably still find space for an old garden rose because there is a whole class, a couple of classes of old garden roses that repeat bloom fairly strongly. Uh, the, the hybrid perpetuals uh, do a great job of that as well as the Portland roses. So if you have something like uh, Ren de Violette, which I think was in your collection or, or at least was listed as something you have. Um, uh, what, what's another one? Um, uh, I think uh, Marchesa Bocella or Jacques Cartier is the, the other name of that one um, is, uh, I mean, these are wonderful plants that bloom repeatedly. I mean, maybe not as, as, you know, quick, quick, quick as some of the shrubs, uh, but big sumptuous blooms, wonderful scents uh, and colors that you aren't going to get in some of the moderns. Now, if you, if you want the best of both worlds, I guess what you do is you, you buy David Austin rose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, I definitely love David Austin, and uh, I was looking at my tracking spreadsheet recently, and 
I'm a collector, if you didn't know that, of David Austin. So it doesn't matter if somebody says those don't perform well in the gardens or they were removed out of, um, out of circulation because they don't perform well. I still want it in my garden and I want to see how it does for me. So um, being a collector of David Austin's, I was looking at my spreadsheet and I have maybe 150 total, but of those, 70 plus are out of um, patent. Um, and so I am constantly on, <laughs> I am constantly on a mission to find all of those outdated roses. And this is uh, for anybody that was in the same situation as me a couple of years ago when I was like, well, I'd like to know the listing of all David Austin's that were ever made because I love them so much and I want to have them and nobody could provide it. And even when I went to David Austin and asked them, you must have a listing of all of the ones that were ever created. Just send me a list so I can drool over it and research. So this is for everybody else who is in that situation. If you sign up for a membership from helpmefind.com, voila, the world opens to you and you can search on hybridizer and it'll show you every rose in one listing, which was so amazing to have that. And so now I know what I'm searching for. And I was able to go through and scrub by um, all the different names, because sometimes they do list the same rows a couple of times, but I've gone through and now I know what's on my wish list. But anytime I find a vendor that sells any of the older David Austins, I scoop it up because I can't wait to try it. And so one of the things that I want to send you, and I really am hoping for you to help me scrub, is I have a list of all of the roses that are, or all of our vendors, our small businesses that sell David Austin roses. And so they either sell the current variety or you can pick through and onesie, twosie people who are selling some of the outdated varieties. But what I was hoping for your help with, Jason, is my listing of Canada, folks who ship to Canada. And maybe if you would just look through that and feel free to share it with your people, but at least it, then they it's, know. It's a big fat zero, it, it, pretty okay. much. <laughs> it, it, you know, sorry, it may, I'll make it really easy for you. Uh, you know, we can get uh, Rogue Valley um, is, is one supplier we can get. I don't think they're heavy on Austin's. Um, and I've heard a couple of people say that they can get something from angel gardens in Florida. Uh, they've worked with uh, the owner of that business. Um, but everybody else without exception says no, no Canada. And I can relate. I understand why now uh, I've been trying to get my roses across the border down to the States. And the process is, uh, is, is daunting to say the least. Uh, there's a, what I found out this year is there's a new pest that they're concerned about. I think it's called the uh, uh, strawberry blossom weevil or something like that. Um, that's that they're that both sides of the border are concerned about. And so now they're putting additional restrictions on all the strawberries and raspberries and, and, uh, and roses. So uh, for me to do that would be really hard. And so I have sympathy for the US vendors who won't ship up to Canada. Um, because I'm one of the Canadian vendors who won't ship down to the States. And it's not because of a lack of willingness. It's just because jumping through those international border hoops is going to be uh, a lot of work. And I have, to, I probably have to wait until I have somebody on the payroll who would be willing to do that for me. Because uh, because right now, there's, there's nobody on the payroll. It's just me. You're telling us that we can't have roses for me this year. I was really hoping. Yeah, I apologize. You know, I've been probably promising people for two or three years now. I'll look into that for next year. Uh, and it, it's something I would love to do. But, um, you know, the development of my business, and I just I'll go on a side tangent here, is that I made a video a little while back saying, when can I quit my day job and, and work full time on the farm? And uh, I'm happy to announce that you're the first one hearing it, that I have done so. Uh, oh, that, thank you. Uh, now, I'm still working there until the end of the year. I, I want to help them to get their stuff together for next year's perennial season. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm doing the planning and working with the growers and all of that. But as of the end of December, I am uh, full time on my own here. And that's kind of a nice change. It, it gives me a real chance to focus on uh, this business and visitors on the farm and propagating more roses and selling more. And the general strategy now is that we're hoping to have um, enough business next year uh, in the in-person sales and the mail order we're doing across Canada that at some point I can consider adding 
some people, uh, helpers into the business who can help me tackle some of those bigger challenges, like trying to get shipping done going into the States. Well, I'm so happy for you. That's wonderful. We are always looking for new vendors. So we will look forward to one day, even if it's two or three years from now that we can have your roses, especially if you're thinking that you might be able to help us find some of those older David Austin roses. That would be nice. I'd be looking for them in Canada as well. Um, I think I've seen a, a small selection of them on Hortico, but their assortment, yeah, they've, their, their, their assortment has come down quite a lot in recent years. So I don't know what's quite going on in that business. Uh, but, uh, but I saw some old Austins in there and, you know, the funny thing that I'm starting to come across now is that when I say, oh, you can't get that in Canada. And, um, invariably when I say that on, on, you know, the Canada Rose exchange or one of my Facebook groups, and then I hear, oh no, I've got that in my garden. I'm like, oh, nice. You know? And so we can, we can hook up and, and, uh, and I can get cuttings or that person can do the cuttings themselves and root it. And I can try to get it back into the trade, at least in my own little corner of the world, which is, uh, as you know, a, a mission that's very near and dear to me is trying to take some of those roses that have, you know, dropped out of the trade, especially if there's something that people really love, you know, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm not under no illusions that every rose that has ever been released is wonderful and pr worth preserving. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you want them to be garden worthy roses. They have to go through, but I, I feel like if there's a group of people who can give me their, their kind of honest feedback from their garden for a number of years and say, I love this rose, it's worth growing. Uh, then I can give some faith to that and at least give it a trial in my own garden, take some cuttings and, uh, and see if I agree. And, uh, and so that's what I've been working on a little bit. I got, I got probably uh, 20 new varieties this year, just from local cuttings, which is, you know, nice. That's wonderful. Uh, and if there's ever a way that I can send cutting your way, you know, but if you're saying that it's difficult to go through, um, the border, then we'll just have to work through that. But I've got a ton <laughs> of roses that I would love to help you keep into production. And in fact, I'm not sure if I've shared with you when I found your channel the first time, I stumbled across uh, Roses Are in Trouble, and I was so captivated by that title that, um, that I uh, you know, had to watch the whole video, and I was so inspired, and I thought, I, th that's when I decided I absolutely 100% want to have antique roses in my garden, and I want to make it my mission to try to learn how to propagate, so thank you for putting that video out. Oh, it's really my, my pleasure. Me. My pleasure, and, and uh uh, so actually, I want to circle back to some of those uh, David Austin roses because yes. I don't have a ton of them in my collection. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly with the out of patent ones, are there any particular ones that I should be looking for uh, that would be good additions to my collection that you think you shouldn't do without or would be wonderful to offer to Canadian gardeners again? Of course. And I'm sure that uh, you're, it'll be interesting to see if you're Canadian uh, folks are as passionate about um, David Austin as we are in the U.S. And I'm sure when I give you these suggestions, you're going to end up with comments from people that I missed one. So be open to that. Uh, expect it. <laughs> but in my review of roses, I manage a, um, a Facebook page that has 20,000 members. And I've got my Rose Geek page. So I get to see what the common thread is that people are looking for roses. So the hot roses this year that are very difficult to find, that if you could add them, you would have a flock of people trying to figure out how to smuggle those out of Canada. <laughs> it would be the Evelyn Rose is number one. And Evelyn goes, you know, you'll be able to catch it sometimes on the David Austin site. It'll be there for a day and it sells out immediately. And so people will end up paying outrageous amounts of money through, you know, secondhand markets to be able to grab her. And the pull for Evelyn is that she is highly fragrant and a beautiful peach rose. And David Austin partnered with Crabtree and Evelyn years ago, I guess in the 1980s when they decided to have this collaboration. And so the Evelyn rose smells like the Evelyn perfume. Um, oh. Now since then, Crabtree and Evelyn has changed hands several times, but the floral fragrance was so um, beautiful. And so, Evelyn is number one. If you can grab that, it's a huge win. The next one that people are trying to find is um, Jeff Hamilton. Let's 
sorry, <laughs> Jeff Hamilton. And people really want this rose. And again, it's a light pink. And for whatever reason, it's just falling out of production. Another one is William Morris. And all of these roses, if they were in the same bed, they would be beautiful. They're really in the same color family of that light pink. So those are the three top roses right now um, that people are really um, trying to find. Now, if somebody is watching and they're saying, I'm not interested in the older ones, I want to buy a, a David Austin that I can readily find, which one is a great bloomer? I highly recommend Olivia. And she'll be out of patent, I think, in the next couple of years. Uh, why everybody likes Olivia, she is a clear pink, um, is that she is the first to bloom in almost everybody's garden every spring when you're dying to have color she will not disappoint. And she is so hardy. I have her in two locations. I have her in full sun and I also have her in partial shade. And she is just a beautiful rose. So I highly recommend Olivia. Another recommendation for newbies that want more of the apricot orangey color. I called David Austin a couple of years ago and said, you know, my daughter is new to gardening. What do you recommend? And they recommended Lady of Shalott. And so she is a orange apricot and the center of her bloom is a darker apricot, just stunning. And so through the summer months, you're gonna see her turn more into a yellow hue um, because you know with everything, heat changes the color slightly. So very good rose. Uh, if you're looking for a cream or a yellow, I would say Vanessa Bell, nonstop blooming for Vanessa. And of course, Anybody who's been watching my videos, they know that a star in my garden is Benjamin Britten. And Benjamin Britten is a orangey red hue and his color is so hard to capture on camera because in person he just looks different and he's just so much fun to look at and gives you a great pop of color no matter what color bed that you're putting him in. So those are my recommendations, but it's like asking a mother to pick her favorite child. I love them all and they all have their own benefits. So I'm sure that you're gonna get a lot of suggestions for the best David Austin rose. Well, one of the things you asked me to circle back on and I apologize because if I'm talking about roses, I'm really passionate, I'm sorry. <laughs> but okay. we want beneficials. I need, you mentioned in one of your videos that there was a predator for sawfly larvae, and that's one of my biggest problems, that and Japanese beetles. So please tell me what I can do to help this problem. Okay, well, you know, in terms of predators, and both of those are eaten by lots of different things, you know, so there's a lot, particularly the Japanese beetle are eaten by a lot of birds. Uh, and even the, uh, the sawfly larvae are eaten by lots of birds, but also larger wasps. And ladybugs. Ladybugs, if they're uh, if the sawfly larvae are smaller, the ladybugs will chow down on them. So when I say this, I'm not telling you to go out to your local grow store and buy a bazillion ladybugs and put them in your garden because that won't work. You know, it, you you put them there one time, they'll feed for a while, then they'll fly off because you know, that's that's the requirement of of ladybirds is that they'll they have a flight requirement built into their breeding. So you won't see them again, right? So the, the, the more sustainable approach is to build your garden with lots and lots of diversity in it. And uh, this is, you know, something I've been working on for a while now is just getting videos out that show people some of the companion plants you can use for roses. But I think the thing is, uh, you know, I can, I can mention some specific plant groups that do a great job. But the idea is that anything that is a particularly a flowering plant in your garden is going to support a diversity of different insects and, and birds and, and wasps and, and, and the, whole, the whole range of different insects that should be out there, uh, sort of balancing your garden. So that if you get an outbreak, uh, an outbreak of uh, you know, aphids, an outbreak of sawfly, uh, an outbreak of, of anything, that there's sort of predators in place and parasitoids and the whole, the whole food chain is there and established. So I, I will talk about some specific plants here or, or specific plant groups. And I think it's helpful to think of them in terms of families. So uh, what I noted down here, uh, mustard family. So the mustard family tend to be cool season growers and they bloom early and they really establish those populations early in the season for you. So if you had something like uh, Erebus, 
Ibris, Aubrietta, uh, Alyssum, uh, those ones in your, in your garden will help to bring in a bunch of the, the beneficials and get them in and their populations established early. Second one, huge, the carrot family, those little tiny flowers in the carrot family. And there's tons in the carrot family. There's dill and fennel and, uh, and false Queen Anne's lace. I'm not talking about the weedy uh, carrot. I'm talking about Ami, A-M-M-I is the, is the genera uh, or genus. Uh, there's lovage, cilantro, uh, oryngium, doesn't look like a carrot family, but it is an astrantia. I'll put in some pictures here as well. If I if yeah. uh, if I'm firing through them very very quickly, I'll put in some names and some pictures uh, when I edit the video. Uh, the daisy family is important as well. Obviously, you know you're you're growing a garden. You probably have some daisy family members in there. But to have echinacea, echinops. Uh, gets lots and lots of yarrow. Yarrow is fantastic for, for bringing in beneficials. And then uh, finally, I'll highlight the mint family and say things like salvias and cat mints and uh, bugle, uh, all of those guys. So it really isn't an issue of just choosing one of these things. It's a matter of uh, looking at your whole garden and saying, look, wherever I add something that fills a gap uh, for color and attractiveness in my garden and puts lots of flowers in there, uh, there's a very good chance that no matter what you've done there, you've also added some uh, some habitat or some flowers or you're feeding a bunch of different beneficial insects that will also balance out your garden. So here's my question with Japanese beetles, and I always struggle with um, if Japanese beetles are being pulled from my neighborhood, and even if I say a half mile radius to my house, if I spend the money and I treat in my soil for grubs that could be eating the roots, that's a good thing. But if I'm doing it to take care of the Japanese beetles, I might take care of my soil, but my neighbors who do absolutely nothing, any of them, <laughs> I'm still going to be pulling theirs to my house with the beautiful scent of my flowers, right? Yeah, so. it's, a, it's, a, it's a community problem. It, it really is. And, you know, you can also, you can have your own measures backfire in a way, which is kind of uh, like, let's say you put in, a, put in some traps, you know, and like I say, those traps have scents in them that are supposed to uh, draw the Japanese beetle from miles away and apparently do, uh, which is, and so if you put those in only your yard, but you don't put them in your neighbor's yard, well, the population can land and more, more beetles show up than get trapped. So they're, they can actually, uh, you can draw them to your garden and you can have uh, sort of, you know, friendly fire damage from putting up those traps in a way. So I, I think it is something you have to be thoughtful about how you approach it. If you have a, uh, an area where there can be traps set out in multiple yards or multiple areas, then that might be a viable thing. But if you're working on your own, uh, you know, maybe, maybe just pulling them off the plants as they, as they, as they appear, that might be your only option that, uh, that is effective. And that's what I've been doing, but I, I chuckle because when I was a new gardener many years ago, and I didn't realize that those bags were actually pulling them to my property, I got so many Japanese beetles from all over the neighborhood that the bags actually broke and it fell on the ground and all these beetles are, you know, falling out everywhere. It was so crazy. And my neighbors came down and, and I said, do you guys have Japanese beetles at your house? And they said, no, but we see you do. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because I'm pulling all of yours. Yeah, you're, all the, you're, you're a wonderful community member. That's what you are. It was, it was so nice of me. And so then I also think about, you know, I live in a community where people are not living there year round. It's like a, a beach community. And I thought, well, maybe they won't know if I go and I put a bag in their yard and I'll pull all the Japanese beetles to their house. That's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the, it's like uh, some, some version of guerrilla gardening, you know, you just uh, <laughs> go down a, go down a, 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 an abandoned road some, somewhere and say, walk 10 feet into the woods and throw a, throw a trap up and <laughs> It's, it's your, it's your guerrilla monitoring program, <laughs> but I really want to thank you for appearing on the channel here and sharing some of your insights, particularly for me uh, to hear about your rose recommendations, which are, are going to be uh, helpful for my collection. I, I crossing my fingers that I can find them locally or find them in somebody's garden in Canada and take some cuttings. I, I, uh, you know, I actually knew that I had a supply of Evelyn. You know, um, I, it's in my it's in my parents' garden, and I'd never really, I never really thought that that was something I wanted. Um, 
you know, and now, uh, now I may, I may have to pop over there and grab some cuttings and, and, uh, and, and see if I can root them. So uh, thank you for that so much. I can't wait to see your pictures of little baby Evelyn's over there, but thanks so much for having me. And I hope we get to meet together again soon. Very much my pleasure.